I welcome you and pray that you will find our worship service meaningful and inspiring. And thank you, Henry, for that beautiful prelude, Song Melody by Walford Davies. I like that. Very mysterious. And for the postlude, Henry's going to play the arreglo, whoops, 
Allegro. Did I say that right? Allegro. Oregano. Oregano. Mas Tosa from The Water Music by George Friedrich Kahn. I know I got that right. So we're looking forward to the water music that comes through. As you know, Henry is our summer resident organist, having recently retired as music director of the Church of the Redeemer in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm tired of it. We're blessed to have all of you here from the Church of the Redeemer. <laughs> now, this is Henry's last Sunday with us, as he will be going on vacation. Our best to you, Henry, and your lovely wife, Lee. But Henry will be back again next summer. You do know that we are very fortunate to have such a gifted and talented musician. Henry, we just want to thank you for your inspiring music that enriches our music, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And today we welcome back the Reverend Paul Tunkel. Enough said. <laughs> See, he's no stranger, is he? <laughs> you know that he also came from the Church of the Redeemer in Baltimore, Maryland. But long before that, I knew you when you were in my diocese, the Diocese of New Jersey. How many years ago was that? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in Paul's so-called retirement, he and his wife Judy live on a farm in Dresden, managing his forest land, raising chickens, vegetables, and a lot of other things. Uh, cannabis. <laughs> I've got six giant cannabis plants in my garden. They're beautiful. <laughs> I'm a farmer. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. And thank you. Paul will be back again next Sunday with us. And so, you said maybe? <laughs> you, he will be here. <laughs> and so let us continue with our liturgy, praising God and giving thanks for the privilege to be able to gather as a faith community in this beautiful chapel by the sea. Let us stand and begin on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, and blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the Gloria on page 356. Glory, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God, Father, we worship you, we give thanks, we praise you for your glory. We bless you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, 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 Lord forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Page 
reading from the book of Proverbs. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our psalm appointed today is Psalm 125, beginning on page 781. 781. Psalm 125. Let us read the psalm in unison. Those who trust in the Lord are like the outside, which cannot be moved, but stands fast forever. The hills stand about Jerusalem, so does the Lord stand around about his people, from this time forth forevermore. The scepter of the wicked shall not hold sway over the land allotted to the just so that the just shall come up with their hands to evil. Show your goodness to the Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are true of heart. As for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will lead them away with the leader of the Lord, but the peace be upon Israel. A reading from the letter of James. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into courts? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But, if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. And yet, you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. <clears throat> Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the little children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven. He sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> That's what it sounds like if you have a hearing impediment. The story about the man with the hearing impediment in the scripture this morning is my focus. Hearing impediment. I went through the ordination process in the Diocese of Maine back in the 1970s and as I was nearing the end of the process, I was dealing with the standing committee. The president of the standing committee was a fellow named Steve Foote. Some of you know him? Yes, okay. So Steve Foote was the president of the standing committee and at the time he was rector of a pretty big church in Falmouth, Forsyth one of the few churches in the Diocese of Maine that had multiple clergy on staff. I was a little anxious about where I was going to work when I finished seminary. So I said to Steve, Hey Steve, if you had an opening at your church, would you hire me? <laughs> well, I was approved for ordination, but uh, he said to me words I will not forget. He said, yeah, Paul, I would hire you, but if I did, I'd have to have a megaphone and a two-by-four. First, I'd have to whack you with the two-by-four to get your attention, and then I'd have to use the megaphone to make sure you were hearing what I was saying. <laughs> Henry Lowe, who's known me the longest of anybody in this room, is laughing the loudest right now. <laughs> Good reason. Uh, yeah, you can be hearing impaired without wearing an electronic device. We are all hearing impaired in one degree or another. My lovely wife likes to point out to me about three times a week how hearing impaired I am when it comes to listening to what she has to say. Um, there, is a, there is an element of hearing that involves concentration and focus and attention, uh, much of which I lack. Some other people may lack that too. So that I have what Judy likes to call silly hearing. I hear what I want to hear. 
Uh, I can't turn on the radio these days. There's nothing on there I want to hear. Yeah. Nothing. It's just COVID, Afghanistan, global warming, COVID, Afghanistan, global warming, over and over and over until I want to put my fingers in my ears. This story about hearing impediment kind of brings to my mind a story about a blind man in John's Gospel who Jesus granted his sight to him and then a debate arose afterwards with the religious authorities of the day about who is really blind. Is it the blind man who became sighted or is it the religious authorities who refuse to recognize God at work in this action who are really blind? And so this story might be asking us the same question, who's, who's really having difficulty hearing? Who's tuned in and who isn't? Last week we had um, a couple of little kids visiting with us um, from out of town, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And Judy uh, read um, to the four-year-old and the two-year-old the story, Horton Hears a Who, by Dr. Seuss. And Horton was the only one in that story who heard the little teeny who thing that was crying out for help. Well, yeah, elephants have big ears. But even beyond that, Horton was sensitive enough to hear the cry of some tiny, helpless creature in need. The letter of James that we heard read just a few minutes ago suggested we need to have ears like Horton in order to hear the cry of the poor. Very important for us to be able to hear that. And I would suggest most of us have selective impediments because we do not let messages like that from the scripture get too far inside <coughs> us. We hear those words about our concern for the poor and then we forget those words because to incorporate them deeply into our being and to act according to that new understanding from hearing, we have to change the way we live. If we had a regard for the poor the way it's described in the letter to James, we'd be a great deal more proactive in working on behalf of the poor. In fact, you'll hear an appeal a little bit later on in this service for a special outreach fund that is doing exactly that in the name of all saints. So it's a way we can participate in that. But frankly, most of what comes to us in the scriptures, we hear selectively. Because when Jesus says, greater love has no one than to lay down their life for their friends, we might say, um, I'm not going to hear that today. I'm not ready to die today for my friends. I don't think I'm ready to pass that high bar. Or we hear the letter of James saying, have regard for the needs of the poor. Are not they the ones who can show us what the love of God is really like? And then we say, well, maybe I hear that, but I don't want to hear it all the way. I don't want to take it to its extreme conclusion because that might involve me liquidating some of my assets and making them available to the poor. And I'm sure not going to do that. Then again, if we claim to be followers of Jesus, then we want our ears open, don't we? Don't we want to be able to hear God addressing us in Scripture and a host of other ways as well? But a dangerous thing to pray to God that our ears would be open because what if God actually did that? What if we actually were tuned in to the needs of our neighbors and able to hear their cry? What if the cry of the poor came to us and disturbed us, came to our door, came into our house? What would we do? How would we claim to be followers of Jesus? So. Perhaps this selective hearing is part of a survival mechanism for us because we live in this world 
we have the circumstances of our lives, and we're not going to be like Horton. We're not going to be like the guy in the story who had Jesus touch his ears. We're not going to completely change everything in our lives for the sake of somebody else. Certainly we might want to help, but let's be reasonable after all. We're Episcopalians. We're not religious lunatics. We're not going to go sell all that we have and give it to the poor. Well, who'd support this church if we did that? So, the story about Jesus coming and touching somebody's ears and making them able to hear, yes, that's a wonderful uh, sort of um, supernatural healing story. And there's lots of them in the scriptures. But it's also the scriptures addressing us and asking us to look within ourselves and say, are you hearing everything? Let hear God saying this to us. Are you hearing everything I'm saying to you today? Is my word getting through to you today? Are you able to incorporate the words of life that I have for you today? Are you willing to make the changes in your life necessary to be a disciple of mine today? And if you, like me, say, no, I don't think I'm ready today, that just means we're still in process, aren't we? We're still working on this thing of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But to your credit, to my credit, we showed up this morning, didn't we? We opened the Bible. We read the words out loud. We listened to them. What effect they will have on us, what changes they will call forth in us, has yet to be revealed. We'll see how that works out in the future. I had a, uh, an experience of, of hearing impediment that really kind of changed the way I viewed that a little bit. We were in uh, Las Vegas visiting uh, my wife's aunt, who has been hearing impaired since birth. She's a graduate of the Goddard School. You've heard of that school? Yeah, very, very fine school. And so uh, they were living in Vegas, um, and they took us to the Strip to go to a casino. And we were in the casino, and it was a great huge room, and way on the other side of the room in the corner, there was a man and a woman and two kids. And they were huddled around a pay phone. You can tell how long ago that was. And uh, we looked at this family, and they looked like they were in some distress. The observation was made, oh, that poor sucker. He lost all the money he brought with him. And he's calling up because he's in trouble. And Judy's aunt, who was hearing impaired, said, You've only got one-tenth of the story. I can tell you what's really going on, because she was reading his lips from across the room. He'd signed over the title to his car, and then he signed over the deed to his house, and had lost all of it. The hearing impaired person was the one who understood what was happening. And the those of us who claim to have crystal clear hearing were clueless as to what was going on. Just another ironic example of how it is that hearing, listening, understanding, appropriately, they're all kind of metaphorical language to help us, help us take that word in. Those of you that have hearing devices here, and I'm sure based on this population, I know there are some out there. <laughs> you know, you can be like Homer Simpson. He was at a worship service one time, and he had, he had the football game on, his, his headphones. <laughs> and at one point in the middle of the sermon, Homer jumped up and went, yes! <laughs> and the minister said, well, thank you very much, Homer. And he said, oh, that's got nothing to do with you. The guy just made a touchdown. <laughs> if you have a hearing device, you could turn me off, couldn't you? Maybe you've done it already. <laughs> we can do that with God. We can turn God off when what God is speaking is too difficult for us at the moment. It doesn't mean we're doomed forever. It doesn't mean we're damned for all time. It just means there's more that we can learn. There's further we can go. There's a deeper discipleship we can live into, and there's a more attentive way of listening 
listening to God when God addresses us, however God chooses to do so. Spitting on the ground and touching our tongue, it sounds distasteful. Sticking a finger in one's ears, it sounds strange, bizarre in some way. And yet, it's a scripture that gives us a huge amount of opportunity. Opportunity to think about how we're doing as disciples of Jesus. This is such a weird, strange time. Look at you all look very weird to me right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these masks and all this stuff, it's, it's such a weird, strange time. It's harder. Maybe it's harder. Maybe it's easier. Maybe we're better able to tune into something new and different because the, the regular things that uh, make up our life have been pulled away. The props that we all normally use have been, have been separated from us. We don't, we don't get to sing. I heard you singing this morning. That's a misdemeanor. You're not allowed to sing. The bishop said so. <laughs> Anyhow, we pray, we pray that as we gather in the presence of the Word of God, we will, we will, as the collect so beautifully puts it, hear it, read it, learn it, inwardly digest it, and bring forth the fruits of good works that come from that. And Lord, we're hearing impaired this morning. We need your touch. We need your help. We pray that you'll come to us, that you'll open our ears, that you'll open our hearts more deeply to what you have to offer. But Lord, we also pray you'll do it gently and in a way that is possible for us to appropriate. Don't throw the tsunami of the gospel at us all at one time. Help us to digest it a little at a time, and maybe we'll get where you want us to go eventually. Amen. Now please stand as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him in all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became in the heart of the Virgin Mary and then was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Trouble, 
for the most to the sick, the powerless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for our presiding bishop, our bishop, all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in the church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And pray for your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Jenny? Oh, just a moment. Uh, as we conclude our prayers this morning, I'd like to call our attention to the fact that on Saturday we'll be observing the 20th anniversary of the attack on September 11, 2001. <clears throat> and we'll be observing that anniversary in the shadow of the tragedy of Afghanistan and the hubris of the Taliban declaring victory. Remembering these things and calling them to mind in prayer, I'm going to ask Henry Lowe to just play one stanza of a national hymn as we enter into a time of prayer for our nation. Cindy Woodruff, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, we have an announcement this morning that I alluded to earlier. Actually, two quick announcements. First, um, many of you on your way into church this morning signed our little registry. I would encourage if you didn't sign it, you sign it on your way out. This is our COVID tracking. Because heaven forbid that you know someone should get back to us and report that they tested positive, we want to be able to let everyone know. 
uh, the situation. Knock on wood, so far everything is fine. Now Druids do that. Christians just say thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second and most importantly, uh, as we conclude our services this summer, this week and next, we're going to be doing a special disaster relief collection. Um, as you all know, Haiti has just been hammered with earthquakes and hurricanes. Ida has wrought destruction in the south and the northeast. The fires continue to range in the west. So we're taking a collection which will then go to the main diocese, which is well positioned to handle national and international assistance. There are envelopes on the porch uh, that just say All Saints Outreach. Uh, you can take one with you, at, and we'll put an offering plate back there if you're not going to be here next week and you'd like to make a contribution, or certainly you can just bring an offering next week. Just be sure uh, on your check that you put disaster relief so that it's credited properly. Thank you. And while we're speaking about the collections, um, are we going to pass the plates this morning? Yes. We are going to pass the plates. Okay. So this is where I would give an offertory sentence, the one I've, the one I've cooked up of late that I've been using. Uh, nothing says love quite like money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I'm saying that should be obvious, but also I, I've been supplying in a half a dozen different Episcopal churches in the region. And they all seem to have similar narratives, and that is COVID has taken quite a toll on their Sunday attendance and their income from parishioners. And so all the churches around here, including All Saints, are very much in need of your financial support. And so walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, and offering and sacrifice to God. Things come of thee, O Lord. And I know that I know that I know that distributing Holy Communion in bread only this morning. Everyone is welcome to receive Holy Communion at this service. We continue with Eucharistic Prayer A, which is found on page 361 in your prayer books. Page 361. 
The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. 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 Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, when the COVID crisis is over, drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is alive, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us seek the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
post-communion prayer is found on page 365. Let us stand and pray together. Eternal God, Eternal God, Eternal God, Eternal God, Eternal God you have graciously accepted us as the living members of your Son, and you have blessed us with the spiritual food, the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace. And grant us strength and courage to love the Lord and serve you. And let the guidance of the sinless heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I'll be here on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock if you want to have a little Bible discussion about next week's lessons. Now you may go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>